Awesome. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Take Back My Brain podcast. Today, I'm very, very excited to have a very special guest. His name is Ryan Blazer, and we're going to talk about everything toxic. He's an environmental specialist. He is has a very amazing story to tell all of us how he kind of got to this place. But most importantly, he's helped us with our house. We had a very insidious mold issue. And so Ryan and his team and testing and everything has really helped us to pinpoint where things were, gave us a lot of education. And so I was just telling Ryan that we've remediated all the mold and we're kind of putting everything back together. And it's been quite a journey as far as tearing your house apart a little bit and also overcoming the mold issues. So Ryan, I appreciate you. And I thank you for being on the podcast. Yeah, you bet. Thanks for having me and help spread the word about this. Yeah. Awesome. Because you are on a mission. You are on a, on a big mission to educate people about the toxicity in and outside of our homes. And so I really appreciate what you're doing. So I would love to know kind of your backstory as to, you know, why you got into this. How did you get into, how did you get into mold and EMFs and all these environmental toxins? Yeah. So I've always been kind of fascinated with how the environment affects the body and and the things around us and influence our health and the way we think. You know, when I was in my 20s, I had a company in, in Phoenix, Arizona. We were designing and building nightclubs and recording studios and uh, high-end uh, restaurants and churches where we would take what's called a vanilla box and we would uh, create the lights and the video and the sound and the acoustics and even all the way down to the layout, the smells, um, the environmental factors, everything that can stimulate the body so that people would go into these environments and, and have a great time. And we learned a lot about all the positive sides to the environments and what stimulation can happen. Now, I, I towards the end of my 20s, moved into a house that had, and I didn't know at the time, it had a bunch of mold. In fact, black mold oh. was pretty bad. Mm -hmm. I got really sick at the point where I was in the hospital, in and out. They thought I had stomach cancer. They want to take oh, my wow. gallbladder out. There's a whole range of different things that they were trying to figure out what was going on with me. And finally, I went to a functional medicine doctor because I didn't, I didn't trust a lot of what I was hearing, you know, because everybody was telling me a different thing. I went to four or five different doctors. Finally, went to a functional medicine doctor and they did a round of testing on me and found that I was, uh, had a lot of mold in my system. And so they said, need to look in, in your environment and see what's going on. Yeah. Uh, and that kind of opened the door to the negative side to the environment of how the, the environment can harm us and hurt us and make us sick and chronically ill. So I moved out of the house, went through detox, got better. Also at the time I did have some, some lead poisoning. I was working on an old scalp wow. that I was restoring, sanding the paint on it and wasn't using the proper mask. And, and so it was kind of like a perfect storm, so to speak, where I had a couple of things that once happened. And because of that, I went back to school education, got some certificates in the Building Biology Institute as a building biologist. Uh, which is the study of how the building affects our body. Mm -hmm. And that all was fascinating to me. I loved it. And then went, uh, took a couple jobs uh, with the government, environmental quality, air quality, and nuclear waste cleanup, uh, a oh. bunch of different things. And we started this company because there was really a big gap in uh, the health and well being of us as far as our environment goes. Now, yeah. you know, you have the EPA, which is supposed to be looking out for us outside of our homes, you know, trees and forests and rivers and things. But there's really nobody that's looking out for us inside of our homes. And so that's yeah. why we created this company to really step in and go through people's house and give them some answers. Um, is your home making you sick? Is it not? Is it a true sanctuary? And what can we do to optimize it? Right, right. Yeah. What percentage of homes would you say have a mold mold issue, perhaps? So, that you know, that it really has to do with the occupants of the home. Some people are a lot more sensitive to mold than others. And I would say 100% of, I'll say this, 100% of homes have mold in them. Mm -hmm. I would say maybe about 70% of those homes have mold that's growing somewhere. When I say mold in them, I mean, there's mold spores floating around in the environment all around us, unless we right. live in amp. So we're going to have mold spores floating around in our house. Where it becomes a problem is when we have a leak or a source of water where those mold spores can land and then start growing and then producing mycotoxins and exponentially more amounts of mold spores. So 70 to 80% of homes have some level of mold growth going on inside of them. Now I would say maybe 20 to 30% of, of homes have a problem that's that's pretty severe, that is truly affecting the occupants of the home negatively. Right, right. So where are you going to find most of the mold? And I think 
I mean, ours were, was our bathroom. And then before that we had, um, an issue inside of our closet, which I, we, I got exposed to mold. We were like, couldn't figure it out. Couldn't figure it out. And then like, looked everywhere, couldn't find it. This was before the last exposure. And then one day I was cleaning out my husband's side of the closet and I took everything out and there's this big strip of black mold in the back of his closet. And it's where, you know, the house came together and, you know, freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing. And it just, I don't know, the house wasn't breathing. You know, I don't know why it grew there. It was just a really odd place to grow. And, um, but I think the obvious places would be, you know, the bathrooms where else are we seeing things that people just don't know about? Yeah, you know, we want to track down mold by looking at water, but mold has to have water to grow. And so it's a lot easier to try to figure out where the water is in the home. And that's, you know, can be underneath sinks. It can be behind the washing machine. It can be around showers. It can be in the attic from a roof leak. It can be in the crawl space or a basement from water seeping in from the outside. But in the case that you're talking about now, it's condensation. So we ha when we have a cold surface, and we have warm, moist air, that warm, warm, moist air wants to condensate on the cold surface. Just like if we had a cold drink out in the middle of summertime and we get the condensation on the yeah. outside. Same thing happens to our wall surfaces. Uh, that can happen in windows, that can happen on cold pipes, a number of different places. So there's spots in the home that are more prone to it than others. And these are the locations where we want to start looking first. Yeah. And I will say we had a challenge too in, in our ceiling, in our attic. So I'm just telling people this so they can pay attention because we had a couple spots on the south side of our house, like in both of the bedrooms. And, and then thought we cleared them up, you know, you paint them with kills and you clean it up, you do all of that and it's good to go. And then they would come back and then they would come back. And then all of a sudden, you know, like we really, we had a, had a mold issue in the attic too. And that was from our bathroom, bathroom fan. That was an issue. So Exactly. Yep. And again, that's condensation. Kind of we got the warm, moist air venting up in there, hitting the cold surface, condensates, gets wet. Now we're feeding the mold. Yeah. So when, how do you know if you've been, if you're that person that's been exposed to mold, what, what do you usually see as issues? Cause I think a lot of people get misdiagnosed and they never get out of their moldy environment. Yeah. Misdiagnosis is a big one. And really you need to go to someone that's familiar with mold. A lot of traditional Western medicine doctors aren't necessarily trained in mold. They're more about what's your symptom. Let's write you a prescription versus let's get to the root cause. So first of all, you got to get to a good doctor that's going to be able to recognize these, but there are two main types of symptoms that we see. And one is going to be more of our allergic type response. And that's from breathing in the mold spore, our body reacts to it. We get the stuffy nose, we get the cough, the watery eyes. Sometimes we can get a rash from that. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's the allergic response. Some people are very allergic and some people it's just their body's way of saying, Hey, there's something going on in here. We're trying to kick this out. We're trying to get rid of it. But the more dangerous side of the mold is the neurotoxic effects. And that's going to come from the mycotoxins. So mold puts off mycotoxins in a way to uh, defend itself and defend its territory. Uh, and it puts off the mold spores as a way to reproduce. That's how it recolonizes. But the, the mycotoxins can get into the brain, into the body. And unfortunately, there's a whole range of, of the symptoms that can come from that uh, brain fog, fatigue, gut issues. Um, I mean, you, you can go on and on with, and what it basically is, is whatever the weakest link in your body is, is where we're going to see this breakdown because it's a literal right. poison that's going through the body. Right. Right. So how do, how do people test for that? How do they know if they've been exposed to mold? So there's a couple ways. Uh, one, you can do a urine analysis and you can test the mycotoxin level in the urine. There's an oats test, an organic acids test mm -hmm. that shows markers for mold. Uh, you can also do a vision test, a VCS test that tests for the contrast, the visual contrast test. And if for people that are exposed to mold, it seems like their contrast seems to go away. And so oh, those are the three yeah. ways we can test the body. Uh, but testing the home, a really good one is an ERMI test. And it's just a dust test you're familiar with. You just test yeah. the dust, get it in. And it will tell you, do we have mold spores in the environment that are above average or not? Now, as you know, the, the testing that can be kind of skewed, the mm -hmm. you know, when you panel back and the legend that says, oh, anything zero and higher is dangerous, is going to kill you. But it's really hard to get a ERMI score of zero these days. Most ERMI scores I see are, you know, 10 to 20 is, seems to be the average. So it's really good to have a professional look at that ERMI score and, and make sure that you're not concerned for no reason. Um, 
but we want to test the mold that way first to see if we have a problem in the house. And a lot of times you can line up, you can do a mycotoxin test on the house and a mycotoxin test on your urine and mm. see if those line up. And that sometimes can give you an indication if that's where it's coming from. Right. And I will say that we did some air testing before, before I started working with you and we got nothing. Like when we had all of that mold in the closet, nothing ever showed up. And so anybody I worked with, like, you've got to have something else going on. I'm like, no, it's, it's mold. Cause it's showing up in my body. I know it is, but I can't find it anywhere. And it just, it never showed up. So what do you say to people who are doing the testing and like, there's nothing showing yeah, you know, just kind of like Ermi is going to kind of real lean one way towards positive. You have a really bad mold problem. I don't want to say false positive, but it's going to tell you have mold. Right. But, uh, air sample is on the other end of the spectrum. It's going to give you a lot of false negatives <clears throat> because it's sampling what's in the air <clears throat> right now at this current time. And if there's no mold spores floating around in the air at that time, it's not going to pick it up. And in a lot of cases, we can be right next to the source but if it's not blooming at the time it's kind of like leaves um on a tree there could be leaves on a tree in summertime and if we're going to go out and, and hold out a net and try to swoop the air for leaves there's not going to be any in it but if we go at fall time when the leaves are falling off then we can sense and pick up and see that there's leaves in the air it doesn't mean there's not um, mold or leaves around us this means the way we're sampling uh has some flaws as far as trying to find where the mold source is Right, right. Do you think that has a lot to do with just way our house construction is? I know our house construction in America is different than, you know, like countries in Europe. And what I've read before, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there's more of a mold issue here than there is in other countries. Yeah. And a lot of it has to do with the way that we're building our homes. We're making our homes very airtight so they don't, don't breathe. And we're making these wall cavities, these little containers that if we don't get the dew point right, that condensation can happen in the walls. Or if we get a small leak, that moisture really has nowhere to go. And then the paper on the back of the drywall is perfect mm -hmm. food for mold. Right? But, yeah, it loves the drywall. And then yeah. it can start on the wood as well. So if you were going to build the perfect home, like what would, what would you do differently than what we currently do to build homes? So one, I would use monolithic wall system. What it means by that is it's a, it's a wall that doesn't have a cavity in it. So the way we build them now is two by four, two by six, and it has a cavity. And then we put insulation in the middle of that. And then we put drywall on one side and we put plywood on the other side and typically plastic on one or both sides to sandwich that in to make an air barrier um, with a monolithic wall system like Adobe, for example. It's a brick, Adobe brick that's solid all the way through that has the thermal properties, the air barrier, everything's kind of built into it. If water moisture gets in there, for one, mold can't eat Adobe. So, but for two, that moisture will e evaporate out. And there's a whole handful of alternative building materials that you can use that are very mold resistant, that mold just can't eat. And that's really the clue or the trick to it. Right, right. Which makes me super excited. I want to build a home and do that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. The, I, we have a traditional built house, but we've sprayed um, some mold inhibitor. There's some things you can do, but our next house, we want to build something different that's right. monolithic. I think that's all of us practitioners. The next house we're going to build is going to look and act much different than what we have now, for sure. So I would love to kind of, um, like, what about like air purifiers and what do you do to get rid of the mold and those types of things? Yeah. So if we, if we find that we have mold in our house, the first thing we need to do is figure out the source of the water that caused the mold in the first place and fix that. So if it's condensation, maybe we need more airflow in the house. Maybe we need more insulation in a certain spot. If it was the leak, obviously let's fix the leak. Let's make sure that we're stopping the water intrusion. That's step one, because once we take the water away, the mold is going to die on its own. It doesn't need a special or specific chemical to kill the mold. Like a lot of people think spray bleach on it or specific chemical, mm -hmm. simply take the water away will make the, the mold quit growing. Now, Part two to that is we want to clean up the mold. So any of the building material that has mold growth on it, we need to remove it. Unless it's on a structural part of the house and it doesn't look like it's uh, rotted the wood, like if you have the two by four stud and it's surface on there and we can wipe that off or we can a light sanding and remove the mold, then we're good with that. But if the mold is inundated into a material that's porous, like the carpet or furniture or the drywall, that needs to be removed and thrown away. 
there's really no no saving that. But then the third step that a lot of people don't do and they miss is the cleanup afterwards. So the whole time the mold's been growing and putting off mycotoxins and mold spores, it's been releasing that in throughout the house. So you might have one corner maybe over here underneath your sink that's growing mold, but it's been releasing mycotoxins that spread throughout your whole house. So you need to do a really good deep clean on your house, your personal belongings. And this is where it gets a little tricky where people say, well, do I need to throw everything away? Do I need to move? And that mm -hmm. totally depends on a couple factors. One is what type of mold it was, because there's a, a wide variety of molds. Some is very, very dangerous, like black mold. Some is not so dangerous at all, but also what, uh, how much of the mold. So what type of mold, but how much mold, if it's just a little teeny patch underneath the kitchen sink, we don't got to move out of the house and throw everything away. But, you know, let's say the whole crawl space is completely inundated and it's been seeping up into the house. Maybe the whole house might be pretty contaminated at that point, but also the health of the occupants, how health, health, how, how healthy are the occupants? Uh, are they allergic to mold? Is it, 80 year old grandma that's suffering from cancer and dementia, or is it, you know, young uh, family that's healthy and active that detox as well. Right. So we've got to take that into account, but also uh, the last thing is how much money are we working with too? A lot of people mm -hmm. don't necessarily have the money to throw everything away and start new. And so we have to take all these things into account and to decide, does this object need to get thrown away? Is it something that we can clean and remediate? And that's, another area where you really need to bring a professional in to help you through that part. Right. So we, we cleaned everything in the house. I washed everything, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then we had somebody come in and do the chlorine dioxide. Can you speak to that? Yeah. So chlorine dioxide is kind of like ozone. It's an oxidator. So what it's going to do is break down the cell wall of any mold spores or bacteria or viruses. It's kind of like um, antibiotics for your house. It's kind of like a reset. So when you put the chlorine dioxide gas in your home, it'll break all that down, start from fresh. Now we still have to do a cleanup after that. Cause it's kind of like, we've got the dead soldiers. Now we've got to clean them up, but everything's dead. So we, we don't have the risk of active mold spores or mycotoxins being around in the environment. Still, maybe we missed something in a crack or a crevice that we couldn't get to with cleaning the chlorine dioxide gas bomb does a really good job of just kind of a wiping the slate clean in our house. Yeah. Which was really important for me because everything was up in our, you know, our attic space and behind the wall cavity. And, you know, it wasn't bad enough to tear, you know, like all of the wall out and that kind of thing, but a section of it. So this way I just knew that it got behind everything just in case we missed something. Yep. Exactly. Yeah, yeah for sure. Um, So what's the difference between it? Because a mold can be super insidious. You like, you know, there's different kinds of mold and like, what's the difference between like the mold you find in your refrigerator and the mold you're going to find in your bathroom where you had a leak? So they, they call them water damage indicator molds. And for some reason, the water damage indicator molds are much more harmful than you're saying your everyday common mold. And I'm not sure if there's really such thing as an everyday common mold, because it just happens to be whatever the mold spores that's floating around where that lands on a sandwich or fruit or a piece of bread or a towel that you left somewhere in the corner of the bathroom. Um, <clears throat> wherever the mold spore lands with the moisture, that's what's going to start growing. But the water damage molds, they need a good amount of water. When I say good, I mean like an, an active source, like mm -hmm. consistent water. 100% saturated for these types of molds to grow. For some reason, they tend to be much more dangerous. But also what matters too is the the source that the mold is eating. So if the mold is eating oh. the, some of this drywall, some of this paper has glues and binders in it and formaldehydes and VOCs. If the mold is eating some, some of this toxic material and releasing these chemicals, it's going to be a lot worse. Right. No, that makes sense. So let's kind of move into your air quality in your house because we're talking how everything is so airtight. And I know that's another thing that you assess and then we assessed in our home as well after we you know, got rid of all the mold to see if there was anything else left there. Um, can you speak to the air quality? Because you know we have air purifiers and you know what else can bother? Or do they work? Like what kind do you need? You know, Where do you go from there? Yeah, and when we're talking about air, we kind of focus on two different categories. One is fresh air. We want fresh air coming into the house. A lot of newer modern homes are so airtight, especially if you're living in a cold or a hot environment, 
the everything is the windows are closed doors are closed the only time we're getting fresh air in and out is when we open the door to go in and out of our house which is not enough at all especially if you have four or five people with pets living in your house we're breathing out co2 we're breathing in oxygen and so by measuring the air quality with co2 monitor you can get an idea of how much fresh air you have going in through your house and the reason that this is important is because we have a whole range of contaminants that can build up in the air quality and the particulates we can get dead skin cells, insect mm -hmm. parts, insect feces, broken down foams and fibers, mold, mold spores, mycotoxins, endotoxins. I, mean, I could go on and on. There's hundreds, if not thousands of things that could be in the air that we're breathing in. So by flushing that out and then bringing in the fresh air, that is a, a really big thing that a lot of homes are missing these days. But the second part of the air quality is, is cleaning the air. So the air that is in my home we want to make sure that we're running that through air filtration to pull all of those particles and contaminants out of the air, the chemical, everything that's in the air. So it's the combination of bringing fresh air in, exhausting stale air out, and then using air filtration to filter the air that we do have in the house. Is there something in particular you want to look for when you're buying an air filter system? You know, there's, they're all... They, they're all, they're kind of like cars. There's so many different cars, but they all serve the same purpose. It's a fan that's pulling air through a filter to catch mm -hmm. part of it. Now, some are bigger, some are smaller, some look better, some have a lifetime warranty, some are quieter, some have Wi-Fi and EMF free. And so you really need to kind of just weigh out all the different factors. Now, you know, we've kind of settled on one that we like called the Jasper mm -hmm. uh, air that checks off all the boxes. It's a little bit more money, but it does have a lifetime warranty. So it's an investment that you're making that's going to be lifelong. Now on the, on the cheap end of things, on the, the other side of the scale, you can just get one of those box fans at you know Walmart or Home Depot and tape uh, an HVAC filter to it. You know, buy oh, a 24, yeah. 24 filter and some duct tape, tape it to the back of that, turn that thing on, and for for fifty bucks, you got yourself an air filter. You know, it doesn't look the best, but hey, put it down in your basement where no one can see it, and who cares? You know, so right. there's, a, there's a nice little range in there. Yeah, they're all doing the same. We're just trying to catch the particles in the filter before they have a chance to. Uh, for us to breathe them in or, or they get on our belongings. Right. So like in your HVAC system, you know, the filters in there, there are specific ones that you should pay attention to that you would, you would suggest buying over another because you can get a range from, you know, a couple bucks to, you know, 50 bucks in an air filter. Yeah. And that's the one thing I would recommend is spending a little money at that point and getting a really nice air filter and go to your thermostat and turn it to the on mode instead of auto. So when it's on auto, it's only going to kick on when it's either heating or cooling. Oh, okay. Just turn it on, run that fan continually, because that's going to be continually cleaning your air, but also moving that fresh air around. So if, if you're in one or two of your rooms most of the day, but the other rooms are empty, it's going to help cycle that air throughout your house. <laughs> or keeping things fresh and keeping things filtered. Yeah. I know when we were testing the air quality in our home, in, in, especially in the basement, we, there's, we don't open many windows and stuff down there. You know, it's Iowa and we have tiny little windows. And so, but just changing from auto to on changed the air quality in our basement. And then we got, you know, much better readings. And so it made a big difference. Yep. Yeah, definitely. So I, I love that. Cause, um, we, even in, in Iowa, I mean, it's, I don't know what it's like where you are right now, Ryan, but it's like negative 30. And so, you know, we haven't opened up the windows for a few days, but this next weekend, you know, when it's 30 again, positive, you know, we'll open up the windows for 10, 15 minutes a day just to get some fresh air in. And then, you know, making sure that our furnace is running the way it's supposed to be running. It makes yeah. a big difference. Well, I'd say even when it's really cold, we're like, you were, it's really cold, right? I think single digits. In fact, the kids are home from school. It's a snow day. Here it's pretty bad, but even even when it's like this, we'll still crack the window a little bit. So we have a, our sliding door in our kitchen. Oh we yeah. Dinner or, or breakfast, and we have the kitchen range hood on. Mm -hmm. I'll go over and just crack the the window or the door, just even like an inch. You can feel the breeze coming. It'll cool it down just a little bit. Sure. But at least we're getting a little bit of flow going, just a little yep. bit. Every day. even when it's cold, we want to cycle that through. Yeah, and we crack our window at night too. I mean, my husband, I freeze him out, but. Um, he tolerates it, but I sleep so much better if we've got fresh air coming in our bedroom window. Yeah. Yeah. It's because you're breathing in more oxygen, less of that carbon dioxide. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So then let's go to like your water. Um, so what concerns should we have with our water systems and why would we want to test them? So the majority of the water that's coming out of our tap 
now is contaminated, unfortunately. There was a study a while back, 90% of the water has the PFOAs, the forever chemicals in it. Mm -hmm. And now I just saw another crazy study that was saying how our water has a ton of microplastics in it, something in the million range of, of microplastics per liter of right. water uh, that's coming out. And so it's, unfortunately, it's just our water is contaminated. That's the bottom line. And so it's really important that we filter that out. Now, it might not, doesn't mean you're going to drink a glass and you're going to die right away, but we're starting to uh, accumulate heavy metals and pharmaceuticals and, and these microplastics into our body that over time is going to cause a lot of issues. So if we can just, it's a lot easier to filter it out than to try to detox our body. Detox later. Great body. Yeah, completely. Yeah. yeah. Much easier. So I recommend everybody have a whole home filter, uh, mm -hmm. and RO system, you know, if you're like, well, I'm renting, I live in an apartment, at least get a countertop picture, you know, that you're like an aquature or something where you're doing reverse osmosis and at least for your drinking and cooking. And then you can get one of those shower heads that you can screw oh, yeah. on it's a filter. Uh, so there's things you can do, even if you're just renting to filter that out. Yeah, I know. It's so important because your skin's your largest organ. And so um, bathing, you know, showering, whatever you're doing um, in your, in your shower, obviously, I mean, you're going to in absorb a lot of toxins that way. Yeah. That's a good point. I'm glad you brought that up. Cause a lot of people don't think about that. Like, Oh, I'm, I'm drinking the water. That's important, but I'm showering. and I'm not worried about it. You're right. You, you can absorb just as much taking a nice hot, long shower than you can drinking from the day. Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absorb. Yeah. And there's some fairly inexpensive filters out there that do a decent job, you know, yep. You can get in your shower and, you know, like you were saying, just countertop models, you know, if you're renting or whatever, you can at least filter some of this stuff out. Yeah. At least start somewhere. Something's better than nothing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's go to, let's talk about EMFs. I don't know that everybody knows what an EMF issue, electromagnetic issues are. Can you explain those? And then how do you assess for that? Yeah. So it's the unnatural energy that a lot of our electronics and fun devices that we have are putting off. So 200 years ago on this planet, before electricity was around, we had the static DC, the North and South Pole, and some light radiation things that come from the sun or from outer space. But other than that, we had a pretty level static electronic field around us. Well, now, fast forward 200 years later, we have devices around us all the time within arm's reach. You know, if you're sitting at your desk, you probably have your laptop, your cell phone, a printer. Mm -hmm. Wi-Fi is over in the corner. We have all these high-powered devices that are putting off this unnatural energy and they're using electrons to vibrate and they're sending that through the airwave. And that's how it's communicating. Well, unfortunately, our bodies are electrical beings as well. Our nervous system, our heart, our brain, even on a cellular level, we're using a little electrical impulses and that's how our body is communicating and working. Now, when we overlay these artificial frequencies or unnatural frequencies, it causes a lot of interference and stress on our body and ultimately inflammation. There's more and more and more studies coming out that are linking this stuff to cancers and tumors right. and low testosterone and a whole range of different things. And so it's really important if we can lower our exposure to these electronic devices as much as possible, we're going to be better off in the long run. Yeah, absolutely. So how do you test for electromagnetic issues in your house? So you can get a meter, you know, they make a real inexpensive one out of the Trifield. I think it's $180 mm -hmm. on Amazon and it tests for magnetic fields, electric fields and radio frequency fields. So electric fields come from all the electrical wiring that's in our house. Anything that's plugged into the wall that uses electricity is going to have an electric field that radiates out six to seven feet. Gotcha. Now the magnetic energy is going to come from uh, motors, fans. Think about uh, your blender or mm -hmm. a fan, the, the ceiling fan or your washing machine or your HVAC system, anything that has a movement in it. Also the high voltage power lines. Uh, mm -hmm. If you live close to those things, they can put off high magnetic energy or the power panel. But then the radio frequency, uh, that's gonna be all of our devices. Anything that sends data over the airwaves. So the cell phone, the Bluetooth speakers, the Wi-Fi. So these are the different types of EMFs. When you say EMF, we're talking about those three different things, electric, magnetic, and the radio frequency. So that's kind of the difference between them and, and, and how we measure them is with a meter. Right. Right. And you have a company that, that does that, like people can contact you and get all the stuff that we're talking about. Right. Yeah. You know, we've kind of um, leaned more over towards, we have a, a kit put together that has all the equipment that we can send out with some training. Cause we're, we're, want, we're wanting to get to the point where we are teaching people and educating mm -hmm. people 
get on the power because it's, as you know, it's not just a one-time thing. It's not just we come right. in and test and it's, yeah, this is like nutrition or fitness. Like it's just a lot better if you understand and learn this stuff yourself because it's a lifelong thing that you need to implement for you and your family. So we've been focusing more on the teaching and giving people the tools so that they can take it into their own hands and test their homes or their family or friends' homes and make the decisions that they need to. Right, right. That's what we're going to do next is conquer the electromagnetic frequencies in our home. Now that we've got the mold remediated, we've tested our water, tested the air, and now it's electromagnetic and just kind of make some changes there, which we already do um, a lot. I mean, we've got everything on a timer. Um, we don't have anything electronic in our bedrooms. The only thing we have is our ceiling fans. Um, you know, we try to really mitigate that, never sleep with our phones, you know, though we have a battery operated alarm clock. I know that sounds archaic, but just to give you an example, I don't want anything. I want to mitigate as much as I can in my own house so that, you know, we don't have to detox all of that because I teach people to detox all the time and it's expensive. You know, it takes a lot of time and a lot of energy and we want to remove as much as we have control over because there's so many things we don't have control over. We don't have control over power lines. We don't have control over, you know, what our utility company does, you know, all those sorts of things. So there's definitely things that we can do to bring that down a little bit. I'm curious, um, what, what's your feeling about, you know, people wear like, you know, EMF, like repellers or uh, mitigators, you know, what's your feeling about that? And like shields for your phone, I would love to know, like, what do you recommend and what's, what's actually works and what doesn't work, Ryan? Yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> Unfortunately, there's a lot of scams out there. They're taking advantage of people and the fears and the, the misunderstanding around EMF. Unfortunately, there's no magic like sticker or pendant that makes a force field around you and protect. Like, I wish it was that easy, but unfortunately, yeah. that's not how the, a lot of these things, the EMF works. It's kind of like if, if you're in a shower and you're like, oh, I want to, I want, I don't want to get wet anymore. I'm like, well, here's a sponge. This sponge absorbs water. So wear this around your neck. Now you can take a shower all you want and you're not going to get wet. Like that's kind of the same concept. We're bathed in EMF from all directions, all around us. Uh, really the only way to block it that way would be to have a full suit of any kind of conductive material. It can be as simple as tinfoil. It doesn't need to be any special material. And that's where you get the whole tinfoil hat jokes, sure. you know, because tinfoil yeah. actually does work you're good at blocking radio frequency. Uh, when it comes to magnetic energy, you really can't block magnetic energy. It goes right through the earth, water, our bodies. Um, and electrical energy is really easy to block with just grounding something, grounding mm -hmm. some material, putting it between you and the source. <clears throat> now, when it comes to the phone cases, there's a little truth to that. They're not really scams. What the problem with is that phones will vary its power depending on how far away it is from the tower. So it sends out a little ping and it says, oh, there's a tower a mile away. I need to be at 20% power. And so it'll, it, it does that to save battery life. Now, if you put a shield or a case around the phone, now when that phone sends a ping out, it has to go through the shield or around the shield and the signal is going to be a lot less. So it's going to say, oh, this, this cell tower is 10 miles away. It's not one mile. I need to boost my power up to 100%. So it's just going to keep adjusting its power to try to overcome that. So that little small area where the shield might protect, maybe the side or whatever, <laughs> but everywhere around it is going to be boosted up much higher. So what we've noticed with measuring and anybody that has a, a measuring device can do the same thing. They can put the phone uh, next to the device without the shield and measure, and then they can put it in the shield <clears throat> and measure next to it. And you'll see it go actually goes up. Yeah. It's because the cell phone has to boost its power now to go up. So as far as the stickers and the pennants, harmonizers, anything claiming to do a force field or block things, don't that those are all scams. And as far as the case goes, um, it's better to do... Uh, practical avoidance. What I mean by that is if we're not on our, if we don't need to be on our phones, uh, if we're doing a podcast and we're not going to take phone calls, we put it on airplane mode. If we're going to be sleeping at night and we don't need to put it on airplane mode. If you're having dinner with the family or hanging out and you're not going to take calls, put it on airplane mode. And that way it's not exposing you. And that way, when you do need to use it, turn it on, use it. But if you can use like headphones, white headphones, so I have these wired headphones are about six feet long, so I can plug it in and I can put the phone, um, you know, across the desk or on the other side of the table and make a phone call through the, the headset. And that the reduction in exposure is like up to 97% versus up to my head versus right. five feet away. I'm reducing the exposure a lot. So it's just 
all about these little tricks and how we're using the phone and mm -hmm. take and put them in the pra in the practice. So you were showing like your wired headphones. I have them too. So you're saying don't use wireless headphones? Correct. Yep. Don't Why? use wireless because when it comes down to how much exposure we're getting, to the, it comes down to three things. One is the proximity. How close are we to these devices? Number two is how long are we using the device? And number three is how strong is the signal? So our, our cell phone checks box all of those off because right. normally 24 seven, 24 hours a day, that phone is within arm's reach. So it's close proximity all around all the time. And it's very powerful because it has to talk back to the tower. Now, when it comes to the Wi-Fi or the Bluetooth headphones, the Bluetooth headphones are right in our ear. So proximity, we're within centimeters from the brain. And even if we're uh, taking a phone call or not, I think it's still transmitting pretty powerfully to talk back to the phone. So we want to focus on things that are near to the body first and then things that we're using a long mm -hmm. amount of time during the day, like our laptop or uh, things we want to focus on second. So that's kind of how we look at these devices, what's in our little bubble. And let's focus on those things first. Right. Start with one thing at a time and gradually, yeah. gradually increase because yeah. it can be really overwhelming. I know people will be listening and be like, so like, I can't live anywhere. I can't do anything. I can't drink anything. You know, like, how am I supposed to live? Because you're know, like, everything is toxic. <laughs> right. You know, and I mean, that's definitely, I know people think that I hear comments like that all the time. Of course, I am around EMF all the time, but what I do is I reduce my exposure a lot, like simple things. Like when I go to bed at night, turn the phone on airplane mode. In fact, we have a switch in our bed that turns the power off to our side of the house. Mm -hmm. So the feel the electric fields, the magnetic fields, and our cell phone gets turned off. That's one third of my life. That doesn't change any inconvenience, no inconvenience to me. It, it's I'm, I still get up and live a normal life, but one third of my exposure, I just cut down. That's a pretty significant reduction. That's huge. So, yeah. yeah huge. We can take little wins like that. We're not trying to get to zero. That's not the goal. The goal is to reduce. Mm -hmm. That's what right. And then do. clean your body out so that it can actually handle the exposure. Exactly. Yeah. So now my body can truly rest and I'm getting really good night's sleep where my body's repairing, it's healing, it's detoxing, it's doing all the things I can, it's supposed to do. And then when I wake up, I'm refreshed and I'm ready to hit the day again. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. That's so good. So as we're kind of wrapping up everything, like what, what are like top three things that you say to people, Hey, do this first and then, you know, work on other things. Uh, you mean as far as EMF or the whole big picture? Really the whole big picture. Where do you start, Ryan? Because that's overwhelming. Like, oh my gosh, what if I have mold? What if I have this? Like, wh where do I start? You know, I would say uh, clean water and clean air. Those are two really big ones right there. And just think about what would nature do? Always go back to use nature as a gold standard. Um, you know, but also natural lighting is an important one. We didn't even talk about lighting. Oh but yeah. Let's, let's, let's stop a second and talk about that. Cause that was one thing on my list I wanted to ch chat about. So let's talk about lighting. Yeah. And so that's another, you know, going back to sleep, sleep is really critical. I think that's one thing that people really underestimate Yeah, you know, people are getting good sleep and that's where a lot of the healing occurs. And one part of that is our circadian rhythm. So circadian rhythm of our body is what tells us when to sleep and when to be awake. And it's no coincidence that we sleep when the sun goes down and we're awake when the sun goes up, at least the majority of us. And that's because we get cues from the sun on when to start producing melatonin to get our body ready for sleep. And the biggest one is the color intensity. So ancestrally, when the sun went down, we would get the, the sunset colors, the oranges, the reds, mm -hmm. the yellows. and then we'd either have a fire or we'd have a lantern or a candle for thousands of years. That's what our bodies were used to. And it was also much lower intensity. And so the problem we have now is the sun goes down and everybody clicks on these bright, cool white lights. And then they turn on the TV and then they look in their cell phone and mm -hmm. their laptops, and all these screens are putting off high levels of blue light, which is telling the body, wait a minute, it's not bedtime. It's the middle of the day. Right. So we're going to not produce melatonin. We're going to stay active. And that's what really throws off our sleeping cycle and our circadian rhythm, but also during the day, we're not getting enough of the full spectrum bright light because we're inside a lot and just going outside, um, you know, recommend doing it in the morning. First thing, get that natural light in your yep. eyes, just to help reset their circadian rhythm. Uh, when it comes to the light, just kind of mimic what the sun is doing. If the sun is outside and bright and full spectrum, 
that's kind of what we want, how we want our eyes and our lighting to be. And if it's if the sun is going down at night, then that's kind of the low intensity, take the blue out, just kind of yeah. mimic that. Yeah. Yeah. What do you feel about blue light glasses and things? I think that's great. So a good example, let's say you need to catch up on some work at night or, you know, you're going to jump on the laptop or something. Now there are settings on your laptop that you can take the blue light out, right. but just as a good rule of thumb, throw the glasses on, or maybe if you're at a party or you're out in, in public, you can put the blue, blue light block on it's going to ensure that that blue light doesn't get into the eyes especially two or three hours before bedtime really important that we make sure we're not getting that blue light in the eyes yeah absolutely and i i would say and my daughter has has some concussion issues and if we don't use the blue lights with her like she just doesn't sleep well she she you know it's really hard for her to even watch tv at night without those glasses um, just because yeah. the neurological effect that all that lighting has yeah yep yeah, exactly yeah. That's important. And the flicker rate to that too. So the, oh, the yeah. system glow, a lot of these cheaper LEDs or the fluorescent lights or these big box stores, the, the lighting flickers and that can mm -hmm. affect it. a lot of people that don't like that. It bothers them. So do you just recommend like just the regular old soft white lights for your home? That, or there, if you want to go one step further, there's a company block blue light.com. Okay. You can just Google them. They're out of Australia. They make low, no flicker, um, circadian rhythm friendly EMF, no EMF lights. The, wow. It's just light. You can that. replace uh, with your current fixtures and just use their lighting. Hmm. That would be nice. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Yeah. Really easy. Yeah. So lighting, that's an important one. Um, you, you know, another thing we didn't talk about is chemical usage either. Okay. Let's, let's hit that. I mean, there's so many things that. we can talk about. So yeah, let's go. I know. Yeah. No, I mean, we talked on all the other main pillars, but yeah, the chemical usage, you know, the chemicals we bring in our house, that we're putting on our body, our personal care products, our cosmetics, our cleaning supplies, uh, uh, the pesticides, the off-gassing, the fragrances. We got to be really cautious because we start to create this toxic soup, especially if we talked about not getting a lot of ventilation and mm -hmm. air being stale and building up in the house. All these things start putting together this nice toxic soup. Now, an interesting, a lot of these chemicals are tested individually by themselves, but none of them are tested in combination with each other. So we don't right. really know what the effects are when we start mix. Well, for example, bleach and ammonia will make chloramine gas, which can kill you pretty quick. Those are both two really common household things. That a lot of times people store in the same cupboard. Mm -hmm. you, know, you have the bleach and then your Windex sitting there in the cupboard and they got a little small leak. You open up that and get a whiff of that. You know, now you're feeling a little light, a little funny the rest of the day. You know, so we got to be cautious of what these chemicals are. So I always say, if you don't know what the chemical is uh, and it's not natural and, and you look at the ingredients and it has a bunch of weird chemical stuff, best to store it outside or maybe just rethink if there's a more natural product. Because once you start going down this healthy path, you'll find there's a lot of healthy alternatives, almost all of these things. If yeah. You know and those are things we have control over. Like you have control over what products you buy, you know, what you're putting on your skin. And that's a really easy switch, you know? So instead of buying the toxic lotion, you buy the non-toxic lotion, or instead of buying, you know, the Windexes and the Cloroxes and those kind of things, you know, you're buying say like an essential oil cleaner, or you make yeah. your own with vinegar. Um, yeah. You know, there's just a lot of, and they're really inexpensive, you know, they're fairly, you know, economical and people can do those things. Exactly. Yep. You know, and that's what, you know, people think, oh my gosh, overwhelming again, but this is where like, you know, listen to the podcasts like this, our, our website, we have a lot of podcasts. We have a lot of free information. We have videos or you can just hire do a, a, a consultant like me or another building biologist, yeah. look them up and just spend an hour on the phone and go over with them and knock out some of this low hanging fruit. Cause all of these things matter. And, and what I find a lot of times in people's homes, they may have one or two things that are bigger, but it's usually it's a combination of all these things at lower level that's coming together to really cause some issues where they just don't feel well. The, the brain fog is worse than it used to be five, 10 years ago. And they just don't have the energy and they feel fatigued and yep. you know, maybe they got weight gain or a rash or something, you know, and all, a lot of these things stem back to the environment, what we're putting in our body and what we're putting on our body is, is so critical. It is, it is, because it really disrupts your hormones. You know, I have so many women that come to me with so many hormone issues and brain fog and all those kind of things. And, you know, we can test the hormones, but we have to know where's the root cause of the issue, what has been disrupting the hormonal issues. 
And, you know, we have to start with what shampoo are you using? What lotion are you using? Because those are all hormone disruptors. And what air are you breathing? And what's in your water? You're talking about the microplastics and the pharmaceuticals and all those things affect how our, our hormones work. And so, yeah, we can put somebody on a hormone protocol and work on it. But if you don't clean up the toxic soup, like you're talking about, you're on this hamster wheel and you're never really going to get anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, a couple easy, good takeaways. One thing I always say too, is take off your shoes at your house. Mm -hmm. If that's something that you're not doing, leave your shoes at the front door because we track so many nasty things in from the outside. You know, we go into a public bathroom and there's E. coli on the ground and, and harsh cleaning supplies and you go fill up your car with gas and you got oils and gasoline, who knows what on the floor. And then you go through the park and the pesticides. And so all of these things get tracked in on our shoes. And then we go walk across the carpet, especially if, if you have kids or little ones that are crawling yeah. on the floor with their hands and that's getting into their mouth. So uh, the homes that I test that have a, a strict no shoe policy are always much, much cleaner and much, much healthier. I mean, that just little, I know, and that's a free one, but it's having the kids and everybody on and the family on board, you know, just, I would say it might be tough in the beginning, but that's going to pay off big time. Yeah. Cause doing... in the end, it's super easy. Like we don't walk around in our house with shoes on. We never have, you know, you just take them off. What's your feeling yeah. on carpet? Uh, carpet is going to be really hard to clean. It's going to collect. It's going to be like a sponge. And so anything that's building up in our environment is going to make its way to the carpet and it, it's going to collect there. And so if you maybe have one or two rooms that you just want to have carpet in, Definitely make sure you have a no shoe rule, vacuum it really good, do deep clean regularly on it. But if we can stick with solid surface and then put rugs out that mm -hmm. we can take out once or twice a year and clean underneath it and clean the rugs, that's ultimately the better way to go. Right, right. Um, how would you suggest cleaning the rugs? Because most people would be like, I'm going to rent the rug doctor. And so then you're putting a water source in all of this toxic soup that tends to be in your rugs. So what, what do you do? You can have it professionally cleaned would be the ideal. And if we can hang them up and let them air dry outside and on the sun and let the sun hit them with the UV rays and kind mm -hmm. of kill everything off. And that would be ultimately the way to go. Or if you got cheaper ones, you can just replace them every couple of years. Yeah. If that's what if you have carpet though, like installed carpet, how do you really clean that? Yeah, that's tough. So if it's, if it's older carpet and you haven't had, you, you had shoes that you're wearing on it, that's always a disaster. Every time we test homes like that, it seems like respiratory issues, breathing issues. Yeah. Uh, it's just really, really hard to clean. Anybody that's done remodeling and tore out carpet knows how nasty it is when you tear yeah. it out. And it yeah. We just tore out all of our carpet in our basement, which I never wanted to start with, but you know, nonetheless, we have carpet in the basement and uh, it was just not that we're dirty because we don't have shoes. shoe. We don't wear shoes, you know, in the house at all, but it was just, you know, it had been wet several times. It was just in the basement. We live in Iowa. It's humid. It's just, it's just a trap for so many yeah. things. And now, you know, we painted it with a, uh, you know, mold-free paint, concrete paint that's non-toxic and it looks so nice. And you just walk down there and it just, I mean, obviously it just smells better. So. Yeah. Yeah. My advice is just get rid of the carpet. That's, I'm not a big fan. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good, good, good one. Anything else that's kind of really practical that you'd be like, try this? I mean, the main thing with the electronics, if you're not using it, turn it off. That's just a good rule of thumb. You turn mm -hmm. it off or unplug it. If it's something you're not using, I talk about practical avoidance where if we can avoid using it. If we don't need to use it, let's turn it off. But if it's something like you like to play video games or something, turn them on, play it, enjoy it, have your fun. But when you're done, put maybe put on a power strip where you can just hit the power strip and, and yep. power everything down. That way you're not sending out this exposure into the room for no reason when you're not using it. Yep. So those are super things. easy things to do. Yeah. And you yeah. were talking about shutting off your side of the house. Like it's easy to, you know, switch off a breaker. Yep. Switch off a breaker. The one we, so we switched off breaker for years. And then finally we hired an electrician to come out and install a device. It's called an EMF kill switch. And it powers down uh, the different circuits in the device in the house with a remote switch, which is kind of cool. Yeah, that is really cool. Awesome. When you make things easy, then it's easy to live this way, but you got to build these systems into your house and be knowledgeable about it. And then once they're there, then it's pretty easy. To follow. Yeah. And it's just doing one little thing at a time. So it but, doesn't have to be overwhelming for sure. Yeah. Yep. Start where you're at and just make improvements. Focus on making improvements. You don't have to do everything overnight. Yep. Any final words? No. Yeah. Just don't let 
of the stuff stress you out, just make the small little improvements and do where you do where you can. And there's always, you know, people like me and you out to help people and guide people yeah. along the way. So. Yeah. And I would, you know, if, if you're up for it, I would definitely get Ryan's course. Um, it comes with all of the testing, um, what I want to call them utensils, but testing devices um, right. that you can use in your home. I mean, it's been a wealth of knowledge for me and my family and I've loved learning. It's been great. So thank you so much, Ryan, for everything that you do. This has been a fantastic conversation and I hope all my listeners have learned a lot. You can start implementing some really practical things. Make sure you check out Ryan's website. All that will be in the show notes and um, just reach out to him if you have some questions or me, if you have any questions and um, let's start living a more toxic free life. So thank you for joining the podcast and I will see you in the next episode. Thank you very much.